South Lawn. Welcome to Arrowhead, the home of Herman Melville, novelist, short story writer, and poet. Melville is best known today for his epic novel, Moby Dick, or The Whale, written here between 1850 and 1851, published in 1851. After some early success as a writer, Melville sought to escape the noise, crowds, and heat of New York City. Melville purchased the old farmhouse on 160 acres in 1850 and lived here for the next 13 years. He wished to be a gentleman farmer and continued to write. As humorously reported in a Boston paper, quote, Herman Melville, the popular young author, has purchased a farm in Berkshire County where he intends to raise poultry, turnips, babies, and other vegetables, unquote. When his later writings failed, Herman was forced to sell the property to his brother and move back to the city to find a job. Arrowhead remained in the extended Melville family until 1927. The Berkshire County Historical Society purchased the house and 44 acres, designated a national landmark in 1975. Herman had been to Berkshire County many times as a teenager to visit his uncle's farm in Pittsfield. It was here that he developed a passion for the outdoors. The Berkshire Hills became a refuge and inspiration for Melville for the rest of his life. Upon moving to the property, Melville found Native American arrowheads in the North Field and gave the house its name. Within weeks, the family were calling themselves the Arrowheads in their letters to family and friends. Entrance of the House the farmhouse was built circa 1785 by one of the early settlers of Pittsfield and served as a home, family farm, and perhaps even a tavern for travelers on this busy road. The original farmhouse remains much as it was in Melville's day. The rear L or wing, built about 1900, replaced a much older one. Herman moved here with his wife Elizabeth, known as Lizzie, their toddler son Malcolm, as well as Melville's mother, three of his four unmarried sisters, and two or three servants. While a large home, it was very crowded. Shortly after moving to Arrowhead, Melville's sister Augusta described their new home in a letter. Our old farmhouse cannot boast much in point of beauty, but it is delightfully comfortable, and that is all that is really necessary in the country. It is an old house, counting it 70 years or more, and though outwardly modernized, retains all its ancient appearance within. It is built after that peculiarly quaint style of architecture which places the chimney, the hugest in proportions, immediately in the center and the rooms around it. An arrangement so totally void of grace and beauty must surely possess some counterbalancing advantage, but as yet I have been unable to discover it, even after having made it the subject of the most profound reflection for a fortnight. Alan Maria Herman and Uncle Thomas Herman Melville's father, Alan Melville, was the son of a wealthy Boston merchant. Alan was given all the advantages of a rich colonial son. Instead of going to college, he chose to go to Europe to be, quote, finished. While in France, he discovered a wealth of fine goods and began importing such items for Americans. Alan met Herman's mother, Maria Gansvoort, the daughter of a very wealthy Dutch family, in Albany while selling his goods. They married and moved to New York City, where Allen sought a better market for his imports. Herman Melville was born in New York City on August 1, 1819, the third child of Allen and Maria. At the time of his birth, the family was still quite well off. Herman attended school and dance classes with his siblings. Over time, the Melvilles moved to even bigger houses and had more children. Allen, a rather poor businessman, eventually fell into great debt. Herman's father declared bankruptcy when Herman was 11 and died two years later. That left Maria with eight children under the age of 17, deeply in debt, supported only by her eldest son, Gansevoort, and 13-year-old Herman. It was at this time that she made the decision to change their last name, adding the E to the end of Melville in case the creditors were to find them. In 1837, cholera was sweeping through Albany, and Maria brought her family to Pittsfield to visit Allen's brother, Thomas Melville, Jr. Uncle Thomas had worked at a British prisoner of war camp in Pittsfield during the War of 1812 and stayed to farm. This is where Herman discovered his love of the outdoors. Herman returned many times in the following years and was very sad when his cousin, who had taken over operations of the farm, sold the farm out of the Melville family without his knowledge. This was one reason Herman purchased the abutting farm, later known as Arrowhead, in 1850. 
seafaring, and the South Pacific. As a 19-year-old unable to find work, Herman briefly served on a merchant ship to Liverpool, England, visiting his brother Gansevoort, who was living there at the time. In January of 1841, again without a job, Herman Melville embarked on an adventure that would shape the rest of his life. He signed on as a seaman on the newly built whale ship Akushnet, headed for the whaling grounds of the South Pacific. It was the height of the whaling industry, as whale oil, which never froze, was in great demand for lubricating machinery. Eighteen months later, the Akushnet dropped anchor at the Marquesas Islands, home of the Tai Pi, natives known to be cannibals. Herman jumped ship with a friend and lived with the Tai Pi for a month. Seeking to leave, he signed on to another whaler and made it to Tahiti after getting involved in a mild sort of mutiny. From Tahiti, he went to Hawaii, homesick Melville enlisted in the Navy, sailing on the frigate United States to return home. In October of 1844, he sailed into Boston Harbor with a multitude of adventures and a knack for storytelling. Encouraged by family and friends, Herman wrote his first book, Tai P, A Peep at Polynesian Life. Melville's elder brother, Gansevoort, brought the book with him to London, where it was published. The book was then published in America with the help of noted writer Washington Irving. It was a great success, gaining Melville some fame and led to his continued writing. Three of his four subsequent books drew on his seafaring experiences and were also successful. Lemuel and Elizabeth Shaw After returning to Boston, Melville began courting Elizabeth Shaw, the daughter of Lemuel Shaw, a childhood friend of Herman's father. They married in 1847 and moved to New York City to share a townhouse with Herman's younger brother, Alan, and his wife. Shaw was a wealthy lawyer and judge. Herman and Lizzie would rely on her father's financial support until Shaw's death in 1861. As a young bride, Lizzie wrote, quote, The illusion is quite dispelled, however, when Herman stalks into my room without even the ceremony of knocking, bringing me perhaps a button to sew on or some such equally romantic occupation. Just imagine a bride, as the girls jokingly call me altogether, mending an old black coat or a pair of stockings. What a picture! but the romance of life must sometimes give place to the realities." Unquote. Number seven, dining or chimney room. This room, the original kitchen of the house, was used by the Melville family as a dining room. With the only open fireplace downstairs, the family used this as a sitting room in the coldest weather. Today, quotes from Melville's short story, I and My Chimney, decorate the fireplace and paneling. Herman's brother, Alan, a great admirer of his brother's writing, had these words inscribed here after acquiring the house in 1863. Melville wrote, I and my chimney, two gray-headed old smokers reside in the country. We are, I may say, old settlers here, particularly my old chimney, which settles more and more every day. The furnishings in the room reflect those used by the extended Melville family. As this was Herman and Lizzie's first home, with no money for decorating it, Furnishings came from friends and family, a collection of older, simpler pieces along with more refined ones. The elegant sideboard came with Herman's mother, Maria. It is on loan from the Berkshire Museum. Thomas Melville. Both of Herman Melville's parents were children of wealthy men who were Revolutionary War heroes. His paternal grandfather, Thomas Melville Sr., participated in the Boston Tea Party and fought in George Washington's army. After the War of 1812, Thomas Sr. helped his son Thomas Jr. purchase the Pittsfield farm that Herman grew to love. Herman's maternal grandfather, Colonel Peter Gansevoort, came from the Dutch community that had settled the Hudson River Valley near Albany, New York. In 1777, he and his soldiers held Fort Stanwix near Rome, New York, preventing British reinforcements from reaching the Hudson River Valley. This was key to a major American victory at Saratoga. After the war, his business grew to include a grist mill and a lumber mill, providing his family with a comfortable living. His son, also named Peter, would later support his sister Maria and her eight children, including Herman. Herman and Lizzie would name their second son Stanwix after the famed battle. Number nine, Herman and Tom's voyage on the meteor. Herman was not the only member of the family to go to sea. His youngest brother, Tom, was a sea captain with his own clipper ship, the meteor. In 1860, trying to leave his worries behind, Herman joined his brother on a voyage to China. Shortly before his trip, Melville wrote, 
I anticipate as much pleasure as, at the age of forty, one temperately can, in the voyage I am going. I go under very happy auspices so far as ship and captain is concerned. A noble ship and a nobler captain, and he my brother. We have the breath of both tropics before us to sail over twice and shall round the world. The passage around Cape Horn of South America was incredibly rough. By the time they arrived in San Francisco, Herman had become terribly homesick and decided to return home. He took the fastest route home over the isthmus of Panama, followed by a paddle steamer across the Gulf of Mexico. Number 10, the North Parlor. The North Parlor was the formal entertaining space for the Melvilles. The more formal times of the 19th century required a room to socialize with friends and acquaintances. Here they would have tea, play cards, or enjoy a musical performance. The melodeon, a small parlor organ, exemplifies the type of instrument common in middle-class homes. Herman's mother, Maria, brought her piano to Arrowhead. Both she and Herman's wife, Lizzie, were trained pianists and could have offered entertainment. Even in the 19th century, the Berkshires were a magnet for writers, musicians, artists, and tourists, all seeking the fresh air, clean water, healthy environs, and natural beauty of the rural setting. The painting of Mount Greylock, as seen from the Melville's Piazza, was done by Jesse Talbot in 1873. While no original building fabric remains in the room, the paint colors are authentic to the 1850s. As in the dining room, the furnishings reflect a mixture of styles. The settee was Maria's from a time when she and Alan had money to buy fine things. Number 11, Sarah Morwood and Broad Hall. Sarah Morwood is shown here in a portrait done by Henry Inman. She and her husband, John Rowland Morwood, were the wealthy New Yorkers who had purchased Uncle Thomas's farm. Her family spent the summer of 1850 there with Herman's family, as the farm was being run as a boarding house. In the fall, the Morwoods took possession of the property, which they named Broad Hall, and Herman and his extended family moved into Arrowhead, located over the hill. They were neighbors and friends and socialized frequently. The children played together so often that there was a cart path through the woods from one house to the other. New anecdotal discoveries suggest the possibility of an extramarital affair between Herman and Sarah. In his 2016 book, Melville in Love, Michael Sheldon puts forth compelling evidence to support his theory. Sarah died of tuberculosis at Broad Hall just weeks before the Melville family moved back to New York. Sarah's son married Herman's niece, Maria, and their family summered at Arrowhead for many years. Herman and Lizzie continued to visit as well. Their last trip to Arrowhead was in 1885. Number 12, Maria Gansevoort and moving to Arrowhead. In the corner of the room is an 18th century corner cabinet, much like the one that stood at Arrowhead when the Melville family moved in. Augusta wrote in a whimsical reference to the cabinet, you've heard of the corner cupboard? Well, this must be it. We have left it standing for its oddity, but elevated from its ignoble use into doing duty as an étagère. An étagère was a set of shelves common to mid-19th century homes where a family would display their finest possessions. The Melville ladies quickly converted the corner cabinet by opening the doors and adorning the shelves with doilies and their best items. As with much of the house, the furnishings reflect a mix of fine antiques from the early days of Maria Melville's marriage when she and Alan had money, along with older, simpler things, often cast-offs from different branches of the families. Number 13, the South Parlor. The South Parlor was the family parlor where the women and children would spend their free time. Facing south, it was brighter and warmer here. They read, wrote letters, did needlework, played games, and gossiped. During the winter of 1850 to 1851, when Herman was writing Moby Dick, the family read aloud from David Copperfield, Charles Dickens' new novel. Lizzie Melville's rocking chair and sewing table remain in the south parlor, as well as a toy cupboard made here and used by Herman and Lizzie's youngest daughter, Fanny. Another role probably fulfilled here was that of a transcriptionist. Herman's handwriting was considered illegible. His sister, Augusta, and Lizzie copied his work so that the manuscripts could be submitted to the publisher. Neither was permitted to add punctuation. Herman considered it the writer's job. This room illustrates the many changes made to Arrowhead over the years. Originally, it was a mirror image of the North Parlor. However, in the mid-20th century, the stairwell was replaced and the fireplace covered over. Number 14, Melville's Connection to the Berkshires. With his first visit to the Berkshires as a teenager, Herman developed a deep and abiding love for the natural beauty of this place. 
His cousin Robert would say this was the place he loved above all others. He included the sights and sounds and stories of the Berkshires in his writings. From his dedication of Pierre, or the Ambiguities, to Mount Greylock, to the Piazza Tales, to the poem Pontusic, Melville was inspired by and reveled in the wonders of his surroundings. When his novels didn't sell, he began to write short stories and poetry. His poem Pontusic celebrates a lake still known and visited for its beauty. Crowning a bluff where gleams the lake below, some pillared pines in well-spaced order stand, and like an open temple show, and here in best of seasons bland, autumnal noontide I look out, from dusk arcades on sunshine all about, beyond the lake in upland cheer, fields, pastoral fields, and barns appear. They skirt the hills where lovely roads, revealed in links through tiers of woods, wind up to indistinct abodes and fairy peopled neighborhoods while further fainter mountains keep, hazed in romance, impenetrably deep, look, corn in stacks on many a farm, and orchards ripe in languorous charm. Number 15, Herman's Sisters. Herman was a third of eight children, four boys and four girls. While all eight lived to adulthood, the eldest son, Gansevoort, died at the age of 30, soon after arriving in London with Herman's first manuscript, leaving Herman responsible for his mother and sisters. As was the custom of the time, his siblings, their spouses, cousins, other relatives, and friends maintained a lively network of correspondence, passing along vital news as well as gossip. Herman's sister Augusta was the family's scribe, keeping in touch with everyone. Much of what we know of life at Arrowhead comes from her letters. Number 16, The Bedchamber. The bedchamber retains more original elements than any other room of the house. The wide pine flooring, wood trim, and fireplace are all original to the house, while the wallpaper is a reproduction of the wallpaper that hung during the time the Melvilles lived there. Two smaller bedrooms were originally located behind this room. One was converted to a large 1940s-era bathroom and now serves as storage. This was Herman and Lizzie's bedroom at Arrowhead, likely shared with the youngest child as was custom at the time. Their firstborn, Malcolm, was only a toddler when the family moved to Arrowhead, and three additional children were born here during their years in the house. The trundle bed belonged to the Melville family and would have been used by the children. Herman and Lizzie frequently retired to their room after dinner and before joining the family in the south parlor for the evening. During this quiet time, Herman would read what he had written that day to Lizzie. Lizzie also used this space as her private sitting area. Lizzie's father, Lemuel Shaw, used it as his personal office and bedchamber when he visited from Boston. Number 17, the Melville children. Herman and Lizzie had four children in six years. All but Malcolm were born at Arrowhead. Malcolm enjoyed playing dress up and acting in plays. He was known as owning the fastest sled in the neighborhood and won many races. He once built a snow fort big enough for 15 boys. Stanwix, known as Stanny, liked playing with his sisters and loved firecrackers. Elizabeth, called Bessie, and Francis, called Fanny, played with a dollhouse built by Stanny, sewed and crocheted doll clothes, and enjoyed the outdoors with their father and brothers. Herman took his children horseback riding, exploring the farm and hunting for wild wintergreen. Lizzie would take the children to Boston to visit her family, and Stanwix spent time in Gansevoort, New York, with Maria's family. All the Melville women played an active role in the upbringing of the Melville children. Number 18, Herman as a father. Herman certainly loved his children, but could be erratic and tyrannical when they misbehaved. As his writing career failed and he was unable to support his growing family, he became more distant, difficult, and easily angered. When he was away from home, as on his trip to San Francisco in 1860, he wrote letters home expressing how much he missed his family. He wrote to Bessie, I hope you take good care of little Fanny and that when you go up the hill, you go this way, that is to say, hand in hand. Bye-bye, Papa. In the end, the children did not have happy lives. Malcolm died at 18 from a self-inflicted gunshot wound, possibly accidental. Stanwix never recovered from his brother's death. He went to sea as a teenager and never really returned. He died in California of tuberculosis in his 30s. Bessie developed rheumatoid arthritis as a child and remained at home with her parents. Fanny married and had four daughters. Her eldest daughter, Eleanor, who knew and loved her grandfather, was instrumental in reviving Melville's name in the 20th century. Number 19, The Study. 
When Melville moved to Arrowhead, despite the large number of people living with him, he took the large north-facing bedroom as his study. He would lock himself in and write furiously for hours at his table pushed up to the window, always in view of Mount Greylock. His table was strewn with rough drafts, reference books, and finished pages. He used quill pens long after they were obsolete. He was still using quills when Mark Twain was using a typewriter. His paper was from the local mills. Once, while riding Moby Dick, he ran out of paper and had to hitch up his horse, Charlie, to the sleigh to go to the paper mill in Lee, Massachusetts. Each day, Lizzie or the serving girl would leave his lunch tray outside the door rather than disturb him. During his years at Arrowhead, he wrote novels, short stories, and poetry. Ultimately, he could not support his family on his meager earnings. After the death of his father-in-law, who had been subsidizing the family, Herman sold the farm to his brother Alan, moved back to New York City, and eventually took a job as a customs inspector at the port where he worked for the next 19 years, earning $4 a day. Number 20, Melville's Writing Routine. While writing Moby Dick during the winter of 1850 to 1851, Melville wrote about his daily routine. I rise at eight thereabouts and go to my barn, say good morning to the horse and give him his breakfast. It goes to my heart to give him a cold one, but it can't be helped. Then pay a visit to my cow, cut up a pumpkin or two for her, and stand by to see her eat it. For it's a pleasant sight to see a cow move her jaws. She does it so mildly and with such a sanctity. My own breakfast over, I go to my workroom and light my fire, then spread my manuscripts on the table, take one business squint at it, and fall to with a will. At two and a half p.m., I hear a preconcerted knock at my door, which, by request, continues till I rise and go to the door, which serves to wean me effectively from my writing, however interested I may be. My evenings I spend in a sort of mesmeric state in my room, not being able to read, only now and then skimming over some large printed book. Number 21, Melville and Nathaniel Hawthorne. Herman Melville and writer Nathaniel Hawthorne met on a hike up Monument Mountain in Great Barrington in August 1850. This was a gathering of literary luminaries where, as one guest recounted the day, Later, everyone was rambling, scrambling, climbing, rhyming, puns flying off in every direction like sparks among the bushes. Before they reached the summit, a swift moving storm passed overhead, and they took great joy in imagining themselves as passengers on a great sea voyage caught in a squall. Herman pretended to haul in sails while Oliver Wendell Holmes professed seasickness, and hilarity and general silliness ensued. Hawthorne and Melville became friends with Melville visiting Hawthorne's home the following day. The two shared many traits, including an unwillingness to bow to the market, instead writing what they wished. At the time, both were in the middle of significant projects. They met as Melville was working on The Whale, later called Moby Dick. Hawthorne is thought to have encouraged Melville to expand the book beyond a tale of whaling on the high seas. Hawthorne, who lived nearby in Lenox for about 18 months, was working on the House of the Seven Gables. Number 22, Leaving Arrowhead. Herman Melville took on considerable debt the day he purchased Arrowhead in September 1850. His hopes to make money writing novels gradually faded, and the family was faced with significant financial challenges. With the help of Lizzie's father, Judge Lemuel Shaw, Herman sold 80 acres to settle some of the debt. In return, the property was put into Lizzie's name. Eventually, Herman's brother, Alan, now a well-to-do lawyer with a wealthy second wife, traded one of his Manhattan townhouses for Arrowhead. For the next 64 years, it served as a sometimes summer home for Alan's daughters. Before leaving the Berkshires, Herman and Lizzie took a second honeymoon in the region. Lizzie wrote, We passed through some of the wildest and most enchanting scenery, both mountain and valley, and I cannot sufficiently congratulate myself that I have seen it before leaving Berkshire. By the time the family left Arrowhead, the dream of life in the country had become a burden. The early years at Arrowhead had been fruitful ones, but the later years were a time of both financial and emotional struggle for Herman Melville and his family. Number 23, Melville's Legacy. After struggling financially for many years, Herman and Lizzie gradually became more comfortable due to a number of small family inheritances. These allowed Herman to publish his poetry. Herman retired from the Custom House in 1885, 
which allowed him to spend more time with Lizzie and Bessie and do his walkabouts through the city, a practice he continued until his death in 1891. Melville wrote poetry for his own pleasure, though his works had largely been forgotten by the public in the United States. Toward the end of life, a group of British writers, scholars, and critics had begun to rediscover his works, foreshadowing the renaissance of his reputation in the 20th century. At the end of his life, he was working on a novella for the first time in many years. After Herman's death, Lizzie found the unfinished manuscript in his papers and chose not to have it published, instead putting it away in a bread box in the attic. Fifteen years later, after her death, it was there for their granddaughter Eleanor to find. Eleanor facilitated getting it finished and published to great acclaim in 1924. It was Billy Budd Sailor. This short work of profound good and evil was the piece that sparked interest in what other things this long-dead author had written, establishing his place among the great American authors. 4. Mount Greylock From his writing desk or the piazza, Herman Melville's view from Arrowhead was of the highest point in Massachusetts, Mount Greylock. Melville even camped at the summit overnight with friends and family. His view of Mount Greylock and his experience of the Berkshire countryside was essential to his most productive periods of writing and his finest works, including Moby Dick. Nathaniel Hawthorne wrote in 1851, On the hither side of Pittsfield sits Herman Melville, shaping out the gigantic conception of his white whale, while the gigantic shape of Greylock looms upon him from his study window. Mount Greylock is located approximately 20 miles from Arrowhead, weather permitting, we recommend you visit Greylock, a Massachusetts state reservation. Number 25, Moby Dick. Herman Melville's best-known novel, Moby Dick, was rewritten at Arrowhead, probably due to the influence of Hawthorne. After their meeting on Monument Mountain, they had many long-ranging conversations. Inspired by Melville's own time on a whaling ship, the novel also incorporates other contemporary events, like the deliberate sinking of the whaling ship Essex in 1820 by a well-known albino sperm whale called Mocha Dick. Moby Dick is now considered one of the great American novels of the 19th century. While today the novel is a classic, in Melville's own time it was a commercial failure. Melville's Moby Dick explores essential moral ideas and concepts, including class and social status, good and evil, and the interactions of a culturally diverse crew. The novel tackles these universal concepts within the context of the whaling industry. The narrative structure of the novel incorporates a wide range of literary devices and forms, including songs, poetry, and even stage directions. Today, the first words of Moby Dick, Call Me Ishmael, are nearly instantly recognizable. Number 26, The Piazza. Off the orientation room is The Piazza. Shortly after buying Arrowhead, Melville used some of his meager funds to build this open porch. The neighbors thought him mad because the porch was on the north side, the coldest side of the house. It should be on the sunny south side. His family was upset because it would not accommodate them all, but Melville built the piazza for himself, a place of contemplation and privacy always in view of Mount Greylock. Melville built his piazza, or porch, to take advantage of the view of Mount Greylock from Arrowhead. In 1856, he published a collection of short stories, including one titled The Piazza. When I removed into the country, it was to occupy an old-fashioned farmhouse, which had no piazza, a deficiency the more regretted because not only did I like piazzas, as somehow combining the coziness of indoors with the freedom of outdoors, and it is so pleasant to inspect your thermometer there, but the country roundabout was such a picture that in buried time, no boy climbs hill or crosses vale without coming upon easels planted in every nook and sunburned painters painting there a very paradise of painters. Now for a house so situated in such a country to have no piazza for the convenience of those who might desire to feast upon the view and take their time and ease about it seemed as much of an omission as if a picture gallery should have no bench. For what but picture galleries are the marble halls of these same limestone hills?' 